Gary's Point, my name is David and I'm coming to you from the Great Ohio and the Canal Rivers where they meet in West Virginia. We're so glad you're with us, whether in person in Nashville, online, or anywhere around the world. We want you to know that here at Grace Point, you are loved and absolutely celebrated here. So bring your whole self, settle in, and enjoy the service. He is so right. Every single person here is so welcome. We are glad that you're here. You're here. One thing we want to do, uh, we don't want to mingle. We don't necessarily want to, to, to do that, go that route. But if you will, just kind of wave around the room, look around, see who's here, make sure you're seen, make sure everybody's seen, blow a kiss to somebody maybe, I don't know. Make them feel loved because you all are very loved and valued. We are glad that you're here. We have a couple of announcements for you today. Hey, Grace Point, you can be seated. Good morning, my name is Nathaniel, pronouns he, him, his, and it's good to see you today. Welcome to our gathering, whether you're in person, online. Um, I said good morning, it might be evening. We're glad you're here. Um, a few announcements. So first off, most important thing, is that there will be no in-person gathering next Sunday. We will all be gathering virtually, and we intend to return the following week on September 12th. Uh, related to that, um, due to concern and love for our community and ourselves and in an effort to uh, prevent further spread of coronavirus, we are suspending all non-Sunday in-person gatherings. So we will still gather here in person on Sundays, but activities such as Young Adult Meetup, uh, that is currently on pause, just for now. Uh, while we give ourselves time to, to as a community to heal and, and have space to do that. There is Books and Brews this Tuesday, virtually at 8 p.m. Central. Uh, we'll be discussing uh, Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy. Um, it's a very powerful book, very difficult book, um, and looking forward to having a chance to discuss that. So even if you don't finish the book, it's okay. I promise it's okay. Um, we would love to have you join us on Zoom, the details are at gracepoint.net slash calendar. And if you're ever interested in how you can participate in a virtual event, those details, those Zoom links are always available at gracepoint.net slash calendar. And I'm realizing as I say calendar, I'm very Midwestern, so yay for Midwestern representation up here today. Um, we're all talented calendar people. Um, furthermore, pride. So we're really excited about Pride September 18th and 19th here in Nashville. So if you're here in person and you would like to participate uh, in our Pride booth, as well as the Pride March, Grace Point will be participating in both of those. So you can go to gracepoint.net slash pride to sign up. And the parade um, is going to be taking place slightly different route than usual. Um, you can also um, learn more about that if you go to Nashville Pride's website. We will have a booth at, I believe it's Bicentennial Park, is that right, Bicentennial? I never get the Centennial and Bicentennial Parks just right. So go to Nashville Pride's website for more details on that. But if you would like to sign up, gracepoint.net slash pride is the best way to do that. We have people available at, um, uh, we need people available at booths between, uh, for every two hour increments on Saturday and Sunday. So they're broken up that way on the sign up. Uh, and you can, you can participate or sign up to participate in the uh, parade at the same time. So it's all on one form. Just go to gracepoint.net slash pride for details on that. I think I didn't miss anything. Um, one last thing. Uh, our work as a community is sustained by you and through you. Um, whether you give with your time, with your resources, with your finances, uh, you make everything we do possible. Uh, you make community possible uh, for people, not just here in Nashville, but for all over the place. So for everyone who gives, 
who gives selflessly, who participates at every level, thank you. Um, it makes a difference, and any amount is significant. Uh, so we're very grateful um, every day for your support, and you can lend your support in a few different ways. Uh, on your announcement sheet, if you're in our physical location, you can scan the QR code. Um, you can also just text Grace Point with an E to 77977. That E is very important. Um, ask me how I know sometimes. Um, so make sure you check those out. You also can uh, deposit like a check or some kind of donation into our offering boxes on both exits as well. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, you are beloved, you are celebrated, and we hope you have a wonderful gathering. Thank you, Nathaniel. I want to ask if y'all stand with us again. This is a, a song that is a Grace Point favorite. I want to hear y'all singing with us on these choruses for sure. There's a world at war caught in suffering caught in brutality may God grant us peace in these sleepless times I can hardly breathe Through brutality I know we'll be free I know that we'll be free Let the light keep it shining Let it break into the darkness All the love dares us to see Love will hold us here, love will join our hands, teach us to have no fear. So we lay our hate down to wash their feet when we see our brother. Oh, we'll all be free. Oh, yes, we'll all be free. Come on, sing it. So let the Sing that we'll be free, oh yeah. We'll all be we surely will we'll be free, free, we'll all be free. Oh we'll be free, free, we'll all be free, we'll be free, free, we'll all be so Maybe seated, thank you. Let's thank our band this morning, shall we? And I'll be honest, I'm not sure if this has happened yet or not, just in case it ha hasn't. Uh, if it has, we can double dip, that's fine. Can we make sure we make our online community joining us on YouTube feel welcome? Can we say good morning, good afternoon, good evening to them? 
Uh, I am so excited to introduce um, our guest speaker, preacher, teacher this morning, um, my friend Kat. Um, just so you know, Kat's book will be available on the way out. There'll be a table. She'll be there um, to sign books. So make sure you do that. And if you're on YouTube, we're going to drop a link in so that you'll be able to order a copy online as well. But let me get the formal introduction out of the way. Kat Armas is a Cuban-American author and podcaster from Miami, Florida, who holds a dual MDiv and MAT. Her first book, Abuelita Faith, What Women on the Margins Teach Us About Wisdom, Persistence, and Strength, sits at the intersection of women, scripture, and Cuban identity. She also explores similar po uh, topics on her podcast, The Protagonistas, which centers the voices of black, indigenous, and other women of color in church leadership and theology. I am so excited for you to hear from Kat today. So excited for you to pick up her book. Will you join me in welcoming Kat as she comes this morning? I got it. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. I asked Josh to... Um, escort me just in case because I am very pregnant, capital V, capital P, and so I, uh, you know, my center of balance is very off. Um, so I'm so happy to be here um, because I am very pregnant. That is one of the reasons why I am happy to be here. I'm at sort of that stage where I do not feel cute and I am just very uncomfortable and in a lot of pain. So I feel very empowered right now. So yeah, thank you for sharing this space with me. <laughs> Um, also, my spouse and I just moved here to Nashville, and so we're also super excited to be local and be officially, I guess, a Nashvillian. Is that what you, we're supposed to call ourselves? <laughs> um, and also, we are, yes, part of the wave of Californians, so we're sorry. I don't know. I, a lot of people aren't very happy about us, so I promise we'll be good neighbors. Um, so today... I wanna to talk to you guys a little bit about this book that I just wrote. Um, well, it just came, I wrote it a while ago, but it just came out um, August 10th with Brazos Press, and it's titled, as Josh said, Abuelita Faith, What Women on the Margins Teach Us About Wisdom, Persistence, and Strength. Um, yeah, and so I'm gonna to talk to you about Abuelita Faith, a grandmother faith. Uh, in Spanish, Abuelita or Abuela means grandmother, um, and then we add the Ita at the end of words as like terms of endearment, so Abuelita Faith. But I wanna to talk to you about uh, an Abuelita Faith as an embodied theology. Also, side note, I am perpetually out of breath, so I will be stopping to breathe. <laughs> um, so yeah, but before I get into that, I do want to sort of position myself socially and locally um, because I believe that all good theologians must name the place from which they speak because theology is always contextual and yes, subjective. Uh, <laughs> I also believe that an embodied or an abuelita theology is very personal, right? Um, it is unique to each of us. And so sharing about myself will hopefully give some context as to the rest of what I'm going to say. Um, so I am a second generation Cuban American from Miami, as Josh mentioned. My family arrived as refugees to Miami, Florida in the early 1960s after just political unrest in Cuba. Um, if you've been following the news at all, you have, may have heard that there is still political unrest in Cuba, and that probably will not subside for a long time because no one really cares about the Cuban people, not the Cuban government and not the US government, but that's a whole nother thing. Um, so yeah, if you've been to Miami, you know that it is a Cuban haven, which means that growing up, my culture was part of the dominant culture. You know, I didn't have to necessarily wrestle with my ethnic identity until I left Miami. And that was a huge culture shock um, for me, considering that I was no longer part of the majority. I quickly realized that my community and my upbringing and the values and the wisdom thereof was not the norm, obviously, <laughs> in the rest of, you know, the country or just really outside of my Cuban haven. Um, and part of that was that I was raised Roman Catholic in an immigrant Roman Catholic community. And we like to say popular Catholicism uh, because many folks who have immigrated sort of bring their conglomeration of Catholicism in colonized uh, countries, which is sort of what my family brought with them. 
Um, but the beacon of faith and spirituality in my life was my grandmother, right, my abuela. Um, abuela was dedicated to the Catholic Church, singing on the choir every week, helping administer the sacraments on the weekends, and doing all the things that older good church ladies do, right? Um, but something I've realized in recent years is that Abuela was dedicated to her survival as much as she was dedicated to her faith. And while the dominating culture might not see those as one in the same, my study of scripture and my leaning into an Abuelita theology or an Abuelita faith through the lens of women in the Bible has proved otherwise. This idea that survival and connection to the divine is intimately acquaint acquainted. Now, I'll come back to this in a second. Uh, but when I got older and uh, I began to pursue my own spirituality and I found myself in spaces very different than that of the religious community that raised me. And when I began to pursue formal theological education in seminary as a young adult in very white evangelical spaces, I began to believe that Abuela's faith or the spirituality that formed me as a young kid wasn't legitimate because it didn't look like what the dominant culture prided or said was genuine faith or true spirituality for many reasons, right? Like the fact that maybe Abuela was Roman Catholic or the fact that her quiet times didn't look the way that is traditionally supposed to look to the dominant culture. She didn't lead a Bible study. She didn't have formal education, period. And I began to believe the oh-so-common lie that I'm sure many of you have also believed at one point or heard, that there is only one right way to think about God and faith and spirituality. I was taught to look for the right way to read a passage or understand a text. And if I wanted to learn about God, I had to learn from the quote-unquote experts, right? The, the people behind the pulpits, the white men behind the pulpits or in front of the classroom. And I soon began to distrust uh, the sacred memories I had with Abuela and my community because her faith, their faith, was more so, as I mentioned, rooted in survival than anything else. And this rootedness in survival does not at all take away from a rootedness in the divine. In fact, it is in that very survival that the divine, that God, is most intimately acquainted where God's heart is beating most fiercely. The more that I dug into scripture with an eye focused on overlooked and unnamed women in the Bible, or who I like to call Abuelita theologians, the more I began to wonder, what if the greatest theologians the world has ever known are those whom the world wouldn't even consider theologians at all? And that's what I wrestle with in this little book, Abuelita Faith. That's sort of the, the central question I ask. What if the greatest theologians in our midst are um, the most overlooked, right, theologians? And so seeking answers to this question led me to see how the faith of so many women in the Bible was rooted in this same survival. And I began to realize that this faith, this real, this raw, this grassroots faith, for most women, including my abuelas, wasn't or isn't lofty, right? It's not an intellectual endeavor. It was an intim and is intimately connected to the body and the land and the community. This embodied faith involves the work of the hands and the preparation of food and, and in the making of clothes and in the use of the body as protest or as agent of liberation. So as I continue to decolonize and deconstruct and all of those things that we're doing with our faith, um, specifically with the faith that was imposed on me by the dominant culture, I am seeking to reclaim this embodied faith, right? This faith of our ancestors, our foremothers, our abuelitas in scripture and beyond. Now I'm gonna share a little bit more about exactly what Abuelita faith or Abuelita theology is, and then I'd love to share with you guys some biblical examples of how we can emulate that faith. So first, an Abuelita theology uh, stems from the reality that in Latinx or Latine, as we sometimes call it, religious culture, matriarchal, matriarchal figures 
preserve and pass along religious traditions, uh, beliefs or practices, and spirituality. Functioning as sort of live-in ministers, particularly because the privilege to receive formal theological education um, is often unavailable, right? So our abuelitas are the functional priestesses and theologians in our families, and I'm sure many of you know an abuelita theologian in your family who may not be um, official, but is very official in your life and in your family. Um, the theologies that many marginalized communities have inherited from these often overlooked women in our lives have given us and the church as a whole a firm foundation of what it means to live out our faith, right? What it means to survive, what it looks like to survive. I love what one Latina theologian says about our overlooked abuelitas. Uh, she says, they did not simply pass on el evangelio, or what we would call the gospel, as a set of accepted dogmatic statements. In fact, they nurtured us with a keen sense of the Spirit's ability to create anew. And this ability to create anew is, I believe, the path toward liberation right, toward envisioning a new world. And it's due to our abuelitas need to survive that births forth creativity and ingenuity like many women in the Bible and many marginalized people across time and history. There's creativity in survival and there's creativity in liberation. Now, in order to embrace this sort of grandmother abuelita faith, we have to understand why it's been overlooked in the first place. As I mentioned, dominating culture has othered, right, many of our abuelitas because of the language or dialect they speak, their accent, the pigmentation of their skin, their cultural customs, lack of Western education, socioeconomic status, and or gender. And this takes me back to this idea of wisdom or knowledge, right? What is wisdom? Like, what is knowledge? Who gets to say what that is? The Bible talks a lot about wisdom, right? It says to find it, to get it, to keep it, to love it. But see, the thing is that Western culture has long made the rules about what is knowledge and what is not, who is wise and who is not. Western dominating culture has positioned itself as the possessors and teachers of knowledge, which has resulted in the marginalizing or silencing of anyone that is outside the elite, the white male, male straight elite academy, right? There's this post-colonial thinker that I love who argues that social justice in our world is not possible without cognitive justice without the ability to recognize the differences of ways of being and knowing in the world, how, how different people across the globe make meaning of their existence. And I just love this, this idea of cognitive justice, of, of wrestling with what is wisdom and who is wise. I believe that in order to decolonize or deconstruct, we must recover the diversity of ways of being and knowing in the world, the myriad of ways that particularly women possess wisdom that is embodied. Dominant culture might say that we have nothing to learn from poor or uneducated people, but Awelita theology says that we have the most to learn. Robin Wall Kimmerer, she's a botanist and member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation, explains that in indigenous ways of knowing, to know a thing doesn't mean to know something just intellectually, right? But to know something, we must know it intuitively. To really know something, you must know it emotionally and spiritually. I think of this in regard to what it means to know the divine, to know God, to know each other, to know ourselves. And this sort of wisdom comes from knowledge passed down to us from our ancestors, right? Ways of being and knowing in the world, a, a wisdom and a knowledge that comes from creation, that comes from the gifts that God has endowed us with, the gifts of our bodies and of our hands. In fact, some call abuelita theology a sort of kitchen theology because it is formed in the kitchen uh, while the black beans are simmering on the stove and the floor is being mopped and the cafecito, the coffee is brewing. 
This sort of theology, this sort of wisdom takes form while family members are sitting around the table discussing la lucha, or the struggle of everyday life. And I'm sure many of you have experienced this. So there's this little verse in 2 Timothy that I stumbled upon um, one day that really sort of changed me and began my discovery of this theology and was sort of the inception of my book. And I wanted to mention it to you as we reflect on this idea of ancestral knowledge or the influence of our abuelitas or as scripture calls them, the cloud of witnesses, right, who have gone before us. So it's 2 Timothy 1, 3 through 5, and it's Paul's introduction to his letter to Timothy, who as many of us might know, that was Paul's sort of like protege. Now, I do want to acknowledge that many of us might have um, a complicated relationship with Paul. I know I do, so I just want to make sure to name that. Um, he's not an easy person to wrestle with. But I love this passage because it's often overlooked, just like our abuelitas. And I'm always seeking to tease out you know, these, these kinds of verses and these kinds of characters and insights in the Bible. So in this passage, Paul tells Timothy, quote, I'm grateful to God whom I serve with a good conscience as my ancestors did. He says, I constantly remember you in my prayers day and night. When I remember your tears, I long to see you so that I can be filled with happiness. He says, I'm reminded of your authentic faith which first lived in your grandmother, your abuela Lois, and your mother, your mama, Eunice. I'm sure that this faith is also inside you. Paul begins by acknowledging his ancestors, right? And then by acknowledging Timothy's faith, which was specifically birthed from his abuelita and his mom, whom Paul names. He's honoring this sort of ancestral faith, right? Putting abuela Lois and mama Eunice's names in ink so that they are forever remembered, canonized, right, if you will. He acknowledges that their faith is a communal faith that takes seriously the impact of not just the people who came before him, but the overlooked women who formed and shaped him. You see, this powerful affirmation changed the course of my life and reminding me that an embodied, a communal, an abuelita faith is crucial to what we would call the gospel or the church, and it has been for centuries since the very beginning. This verse also led me to retrain and sort of recenter my thinking, allowing me to see new characters and new insights calling to me from the pages of the Bible. And it led me to wonder, like, what was Abuela Lois's and, um, and Mama Eunice's faith like? Like, what sort of embodied theology did they partake in? The Bible doesn't give us much, you know, considering that um, it is, a, while I believe divinely inspired, it is a book, you know, written by men for men. So when we read little nuggets like this, I like to encourage myself and others to let our theological imagination soar, to ask questions about the text, the characters, the stories, what is left unsaid. So I wanna wrestle with this a tiny bit more um, in community because I believe that that's how theology is done. And so I wanna share with you about two biblical ancestors or abuelita theologians whom we can look to for examples of this embodied faith that I'm talking about. So the first one is Tabitha. I don't know if you guys remember, um, she's a sort of quickly mentioned character in Acts 9. And what I love about the story of Tabitha is that if you actually look at any Bible translation, the, um, you know, the headings of each section or whatever, which are not obviously in the original Greek, but it literally just says, Paul resurrects someone or something like that, right? Like Paul's resurrection or I don't know what. Um, and you see that a lot, but her story kind of gets pushed to the background and I would love to bring her to the surface. So in Acts 9, we learn of this woman, Tabitha, um, and she is called a disciple. In fact, she is unique because she is a woman specifically given that title. In other places in the New Testament, women and men together are called disciples, but Tabitha is specifically called a disciple, and I, I love that. So in this story, Tabitha dies, and Peter is called upon to come and resurrect her. And of course, while all life is 100% worthy of resurrection, I can't help but pause at this detail. In my theological imagination, I'm wondering why Tabitha, 
right? Like, as we know, not everyone who died in the New Testament is resurrected. In fact, besides Jesus, there's only like three other people who are resurrected. So this tells me that I shouldn't rush past this abuelita theologian, right? I should sort of let my gaze linger on her. I should pay attention to her story because perhaps this resurrection detail gives us insight into who Tabitha was, right? Her importance in the community. Now, again, we don't know much about Tabitha. We aren't given, you know, too many details about her life except for one. Actually, which I think is a fascinating detail, um, and to me is the perfect description of what, of what an Awalita theology or an Awalita faith is. In Acts 9:39, it says that upon Peter's arrival, he was taken to the upstairs room where she had died, and all the widows stood beside him, crying as they showed the tunics and other clothing. Tabitha made when she was alive. This scene is so striking to me <laughs> because out of all of the examples of Tabitha's influence and her faith and her status as a disciple, it was the evidence of the clothes she made that is brought to our attention. Imagine, right, a room full of abuelitas, of widows, specifically of women in the community who are often overlooked, disregarded, forgotten, ignored, grieving the loss of their dear friend who noticed them, right? Who took care of them and their evidence, the clothes. Look, look what she made for us, her intentionality, her commitment, her devotion. When my abuela first arrived from Cuba, she worked at a clothing factory like many women or many Cuban immigrants that arrived in Miami. But after several years, she was able to save up enough money and buy herself a sewing machine, and she began making clothes from home. And she would sell her clothes to provide for our family. Our front door was constantly swinging open with women and men from the community, you know, coming over for fittings and coffee and friendship. Abuela's hands, carried so much knowledge and wisdom. They changed lives, her, her physical hands. She created entire worlds from a single thread and a needle. And in that, she served and she loved and she knew the measurements of those who came over. She paid attention to our bodies. She was intentional. I don't think we really understand the weight of that in many marginalized communities, in abuelas or in Tabitha's. And I want to add that uh, that scene in Acts 9 carries particular weight because if you remember a few chapters before in Acts, there's a whole debacle with the Greek-speaking Jews and the native Hebrews, and, and it's a, literally about the widows and the fact that they were being overlooked. And so we have, you know, they come together and they try and figure it out and they appoint people to literally just care for the widows. And here we have Tabitha doing the very thing that God calls God's people to do. Tabitha is an overlooked abuelita theologian who herself not only noticed those who were overlooked in her midst, but through the work of her hands, through her embodied wisdom, she provided and served. And that's the glimpse of who she was that we get. We know nothing about her but that she made clothes and her life was worthy of resurrection. In fact, I love this little detail. Some scholars call her an early community organizer, an activist that cared for the group of people that God calls God's people to care for. So Tabitha, alongside my own abuela, taught me that faith is more than what we know in our heads. It's what we know with our bodies and how we give that as a gift on behalf to God and others. I just have one more abuelita theologian, and that is, um, well, there's plenty more, but one more that I'll talk about today. Um, and this is Miriam, but I specifically want to talk about Exodus 15. Um, so Miriam, if you remember, is Aaron and Moses' sister, who is called prophet. Another fun detail, she's the first person in all of the Bible to be called a prophet. Not the first woman to be called a prophet, just the first person. Anyway, I can't talk about Exodus without giving a shout out to the women in the beginning of the narrative. You see, when we think of the characters in Exodus, we often think of Moses, right? But the story of Exodus is so subversive and so full of embodied knowledge and wisdom because of the women. 
Now, I go into detail in my book, um, so I'll leave some of it for when you guys read it, but right now, I'll quickly go through some of the characters in the story that actually lead toward Miriam in Exodus 15. So first, we have his mother, Jochebed, and she is incredible because she engages in civil disobedience to save Moses' life. She ignores the commands of Pharaoh that all young boys should die. Instead, she hides her young son, as we know, and I love that the text tells us this, and another overlooked detail, that she creates baskets out of weeds, trusting in the plants of the earth to protect her son, and then she places him in the Nile, the river, the unpredictable and living thing, the actual means which Pharaoh used to kill the boys, she uses to save hers. It was this basket and this river and her ingenuity and her creativity and her courage that saved his life. But it doesn't end there. Next, we have Shipra and Pua, right? The midwives who also play a role in saving the Hebrew boys by lying to Pharaoh. And if you know anything about midwives, they are women of embodied wisdom, particularly midwives in ancient Israel. In fact, they, were, they functioned as sort of spiritual leaders and healers during that time. They would perform rituals to these new infants that they would deliver. They would um, prepare herbal potions to take care of the mother. I mean, these were, were women of embodied knowledge. And they did this in a time when infant mortality rate was like extremely high. And they were women of great faith, right? God used them um, to essentially save a nation. And through the knowledge of their bodies, they protected the Hebrew boys, right? And remember what I said earlier, that wisdom is often birthed through and because of survival. But now we get to Miriam, Moses' sister. And my favorite detail of Miriam's story is found in Exodus 15, after God saves the Israelites from their oppressors. Right, they cross over the Red Sea and just making it to the other side before the water kind of floods back to normal. And as soon as that happens, Miriam does this extraordinary thing. The text says that she takes out her timbrels and she leads the community in song and dance. And I love this because isn't this, this isn't the only place in the Bible that we read of folks dancing before God. In fact, this was a legitimate form of worship. Dance was a sacred way to express love and devotion to God and Israel, and this is true across time and history. In her book, Rising Strong, Brene Brown reminds us that we move what we're learning from our heads to our hearts through our hands. In fact, the Asaro tribe of Indonesia has a beautiful saying that says, knowledge is only a rumor until it lives in the muscle. And I think this is such a perfect description of what we see in Miriam and the Israelites. She served her community by leading them and allowing their knowing to become full-bodied expressions of joy and liberation. Some scholars actually point out the wisdom Miriam had, not just in the movements of her body, but in her being prepared for celebration by literally carrying instruments in her pocket, anticipating that God would perform a miracle. Her wisdom lived in her bones and in her muscles. And I think this is so important to point out because the dominating culture has long oppressed and suppressed the human body, which in turn has suppressed the spirit. Whether it was through literal chains, through slavery, through the attempt to own and subjugate bodies, or whether it's to label bodies as shameful, lustful, a cause of stumbling. We see in the Bible that worshipful bodies are liberated bodies, that body and soul are intimately connected, and I believe God wants bodies to be free. And Miriam, an overlooked Awalita theologian, reminds us of this truth. Now, there are so many other examples that I could share with you about Awalita theologians in Scripture and how they live in embodied theology, but my time is up, and you could read more about them in Awalita faith. But I'd love to leave you with one more verse, a verse that I love to reclaim as it's been used and misused, like so much of scripture. And it's 1 Corinthians 6, 19 that says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? An abuelita faith acknowledges the Holy Spirit as the wild child of the Trinity, an abuelita who she herself is full of possibilities, who leads us in creativity and ingenuity, who affirms that our bodies are temples of divine joy and divine movement and divine celebration and divine freedom and divine wisdom. 
and it is she who connects us to the cloud of witnesses, to the wisdom of our ancestors. So may you go this week reflecting on your own ancestors, both spiritual and physical, and leaning on alternate ways of being and knowing in the world so that we all, like the Holy Spirit and like our abuelitas in the Bible and beyond, can be agents of liberation. And may we look to those who are often overlooked in our midst as legitimate sources of theology. And may we look to the struggle of survival as our greatest teacher of the divine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kat. That was amazing. So, such a beautiful perspective, right? Isn't that amazing? I can't wait to read that. Thank you again. Our community is so grateful that you were with us today. We've got, um, we want to do another song for you today. You don't have to stand up. Um, we have a, an artist friend of mine, Andrew Galucky, and this is a song of his. Look for his music um, when you leave here today. It's amazing. Thank you all for being with us. Look now There's more to see Can we thank Kat one more time? Um, 
please stop by the, the table. She'll be there ready to sign a book. Uh, you definitely want to read this one. It's incredible. Um, as we get ready to go, just recognize um, that in the world we live in, um, it seems like there's always something, doesn't there? Like, I don't know about you, but it feels like the bad, bad things are just like are hemorrhaging all around us. Um, we have uh, the flooding in Waverly. We have this pandemic, which is not going anywhere. Um, we have what's happening in Afghanistan, just all over the place. And I just want to remind us as a community that it can be exhausting, but every single ounce of goodness and light changes the world. It, it moves the needle, even if, it, even if you can't see it, even if you don't know it, what you're doing, how you show up in the world, how you embody your faith and goodness in the world, it moves the needle. So thank you for being the community that you are. Let's keep going out into the world and keep embodying those values. And we're gonna improve the world bit by bit by bit. Are you with me? All right. Don't forget, uh, if you come here next week, you will be alone um, because we are virtual only next week. So have a great week, have a good Labor Day. We love you, we'll see you soon.